Welcome to the next session after lunch. We have here Michael Fowell, who in past LCAs has been sort of sitting up in the box up there doing the AV work. Uh, but he's spent the last few years trying to reverse engineering, reverse engineer the smart cars that we use for our public transport. Uh, he won't be taking questions, and this is his first talk at LCA. So welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk today. It's uh, really inspiring. Um, I want to start off my talk today with a, with a small disclaimer. Um, the work presented here is done as a personal project on my personal time and not connected with or endorsed by my employer. The opinions stated here are my own and not of, of uh, current or past employers. Information is collected from the public domain and open to research. I do not condone fair evasion and none of my software supports it. And this is also not endorsed by any public transit agency. Um, today I'm going to talk about reading public transit smart cards, which is a process of reverse engineering unknown data binary data files. Most talks focus on implementation flaws that give you free rides and they develop their own private program that exploits that. I'm going to talk about the process of getting access to and understanding meaningful data written to these cards. Think of it as an open data talk, but with a crowbar. <laughs> but first, what is in these cards anyway? NFC smart cards are an all-in-one device. Older devices have an integrated circus that does everything. It's implemented in discrete logic and can't be updated. The newer devices use a microcontroller. Some have an operating system that allows running user code, generally written in Java card, and the operating system is stored on ROM. They are powered by induction and run at low voltages, so can't be very computationally powerful. Uh, they do bidirectional communication over radio, though simple tokens just report back a number. They have some storage, it might be rewritable or it might be write once. And the integrated circuit or microcontroller in the, in the card controls access to the data and may implement some form of encryption. And most Android phones contain NFC hardware that is usable by third party applications. And most cards follow the standards, so they can be read by most Android phones. So, smart cards and public transportation. The first system in the world started rolling out in 1996 in South Korea, followed in 1997 in Hong Kong. Uh, these are made by a small number of vendors worldwide who generally don't roll their own stuff from scratch. Each has minor tweaks for the agency's fare structure and other business requirements. In Australia, the first systems appeared in Sydney. The plans were announced in 1996. The contract was awarded in 2002. The trials began in 2005, all just in time for the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. <laughs> this was then scrapped in 2007 and re-awarded to another company who started rolling it out in 2012. This was followed by Perth in 2005, Southeast in Queensland in 2006, Victoria and Tasmania in 2009, uh, Adelaide and Canberra in 2011, and the Northern Territory in 2014. Plus, there's a number of other regional operators who I, who I haven't mentioned here. The, uh, these systems are typically designed by a small group of companies. Um, they're mostly off the shelf with some customization. That's great for me because it means these systems are designed in largely similar ways. It also means that the, the work done on one city system can apply to another, and I found a couple of examples of this. The only exception was Victoria. They built their system entirely from scratch because of reasons. So I wrote a program called MetroDroid, and this reads public transit smart cards offline. I implemented support for five cards in use in Australia, covering Sydney's Opal and Manly Fast Ferry cards, Brisbane's Go card, Perth's Smart Rider card, Canberra's MyWay card. I also implemented support for a couple of non-Australian cards, they are Hong Kong's Octopus card and Los Angeles Tap card. And this is distributed on the Google Play Store and F-Droid. In the end, I can now read five out of nine of the major cards in Australia, uh, at least the balance information. So why do operators need to store data on the card anyway? Let's look at how a public transit ticketing system may work from a high level. 
Now this doesn't represent any particular system, it's more of a general description and some bits may be in one system but not in others. To start off you have a back office system and this has a database of all of the cards, their balances and the transaction ledger. You also have some fixed validators like on train platforms and ferry wharves. These normally have a fixed network connection to the back office. You might also have a website, and this allows online top-up facilities by credit card, and you might also have some vending machines. If you're looking at a traditional system design, you connect all your readers to the back office system, and then you're done. You process every transaction online, and that back office is your source of truth. But there's a problem. Even if you're able to scale your transaction processing capabilities to handle peak hours, and you assume that fixed network connections are perfectly reliable, you also have buses and they move. They normally only have an intermittent connection to the back office system. They go in tunnels, they drop out. So you have to store some of the recent transactions on the card as well as its balance. When you use the card on a bus, the bus's uh, validator calculates the fare and adds a transaction to the ledger on the card and at the bus. And then when you use it on a train, you use it to enter the station. It records the contents of the card um, and adds its own transaction to the ledger and updates the balance. Then as the validators get connectivity, they send these transactions to the back office system. Uh, it audits the transactions received from each validator unit as they get connectivity to ensure that they're all okay. There's a speed advantage for machines here as well because there's less interactive load on that back office system and everything can be run as a batch job. So let's look at a simple fraud example with a replay attack and how to detect and mitigate against it. Say your adversary has a card with a balance of $5 and then they make a backup of it. They then use this to board a bus. The bus trip in this example costs $4, uh, and that entry is added to the ledger on the card and recorded to the bus's validator, and the, their balance is now $1. They then restore that backup, bringing the balance on the card back to $5, effectively rolling back the fare. They then use this card to board a train. The fare is again $4. That entry is added to the ledger on the card and recorded at the station's validator. These transactions are eventually audited in that back office system and a conflict is detected. The card ID can then be cancelled and added to a global block list so this can be no longer used regardless of value. The adversary would need another card in order to get free rides. So how is that data stored? To start off with, every card has a serial number. It may also contain some manufacturing information about who made it, uh, when it was made and how much memory it has. Simple cards are comprised of sectors containing user data, sorry, user data, access control labels like read only, read write, and decrement only, and keys that are used for authentication with the card. This is how MyFair Classic and MyFair Ultralight cards present themselves. MyFair Classic is used in Brisbane's Go Card, Canberra's MyWay Card, Tasmania's Green Card, and Perth's Smart Rider. More complex cards divide up the memory into applications with well known IDs. This allows a card to have multiple functions, like a frequent flyer card that also acts as a credit card, and each application owner keeps their own keys to this system. They may also use files instead of sectors, and those files can have well-known functionality. For example, a purse file could implement validation rules and store credit information in a defined way. They could have one set of keys which is used to decrement the balance, and then a different set of keys that is used allowed to increment it. They also may run some Java card applets, which allows more complex business roles and custom cryptography to be implemented on the card. The files can also be of arbitrary lengths. This is how MyFair Deskfire presents itself, which is used in Sydney's Opal card, Adelaide's Metro card, and Melbourne's Mikey. So I'd like to get access to the data on the card itself, and I'd like to be able to do this anywhere. I'd like to do this without registration where I need to hand over a bunch of personal information in the process. And I live in Sydney, so let's start with the Opal card. The Opal card is readable by most Android devices and all but one of the files is locked. It uses public key authentication and encryption, which is fairly strong. I show on the slide a example of uh, that readable file in base 16 encoding and it's 16 bytes long but we don't yet know what this data represents so we need some facts. 
One source of facts uh, is the Opal Travel app. Um, this can read data from the card itself, and I can restrict network access to verify that fact. And I can also look for some expected constants. And using the Opal website shows a lot more information like the ledger, but unfortunately this data isn't accessible. And now we know what we could read, we can go looking for this data on the card itself. First of all, there is the card number. I observe that all the Opal cards start with 308522. That last digit is probably a checksum, so I'm going to look for that card number. And the Opal card number is something that I can quickly identify with a hex editor. And here is the card number, a 32-bit unsigned little Endian integer. The balance was a little bit more of a challenge because the balance, either in cents or dollars and cents, doesn't appear anywhere, anywhere at least in a byte-lined way. So I converted the file to a long binary string. I then convert the balance of 336 cents to a binary as well. And I find the balance stored in bits 54 through 75. Though in reality, there was a little bit more experimenting to know how long the number was. I also wrote a small Python script to automate this process and try a few different encoding methods. And now that's in the Metrodoid source repository. The date of last use, uh, I first tried to see what the, it, if it was the day of the year, and I looked for the number 277 with the program and found nothing. Um, I eventually did some experimenting with different epochs and found that the, the correct epoch is the 1st of January 1980, and the magical number of 13,061 appears in that file. So finally, we test all that information that we found out in the field. I implemented the reader for it in Python, and once that was working well, I implemented it properly in Java for Metroid. I ran some more tests and made sure all the bugs and special cases were handled. Um, an early mistake was the handling of neg negative balances, which was handled after taking a snapshot of a card with a negative balance. And now the app can read it too. Like so. Yeah. Live demos, fun. Yeah. So Opal is a fairly nice system to work with, and it doesn't require any encryption keys to get useful data. This appears to be a design decision by Transport for New South Wales. By comparison, London's Oyster card is produced by the same vendor using the same card technology and doesn't appear to have any open files. Um, San Francisco's Clipper card, which is also by the same vendor using the same card, card technology, has even more data in its open files. The cards are free, and, but they require a $10 minimum recharge, and so it's ideal for testing. There's optional online registration. And online services are available without registration, including top-ups, unlike literally every other system in Australia. They also have a mobile-friendly website, unlike many systems in Australia. But for some reason, they block rooted phones with their app. So after being successful with the Opal card, I moved on to the Manly Fast Ferry. They are a private ferry operator in Sydney. They use their own card system, which was introduced in 2009. And while I don't regularly use it, I did have a card for it. They use a MyFair Classic 1K card, which is an older card system. It's not standard NFC, so it can only be read by phones with an NXP chipset. The first sector is readable, and that has 32 bytes of data. The other sectors are unreadable, and they are locked with a per card key. So let's look at how that MyFair Classic card is laid out. Uh, it has 16 sectors of 64 bytes each. Sector 0 has the serial number, manufacturing information, and 32 bytes for user data. Sectors 1 and above have 48 bytes for user data. And each sector has two 48-bit keys for access control. There are permission beat, bits for each of these keys, such as read-only and read-write. Um, and there's also no such thing as open access, though some use a well-known key, of which there are many. Um, these keys are used to authenticate with the card, so you can't just dump all the data and get an encrypted blob. So the, Man the Manly Fast Ferry at the time had no online service for ticketing. The terminals appeared to operate offline and part-time. You always had to hand your smart card to a conductor to do all the transactions, and there's no such thing as a vending machine. 
So I need to find out what is on my card. I go to the ticket office and ask for a printout of my balance. And that printout gave me much more and it was a complete transcript of everything on the card. And all of the data on the card in a human readable form. And everything was either a purse credit or a purse debit. And they were using it as a very simple stored value card. There were mentions on the receipt about a travel pass and I found that these were discontinued. The purchases on the onboard shop were also a purse debit, so it was very difficult to see where you actually went. I found my card number in that open sector, but nothing else. I compared the card with some friends' card and had the same problems, and none of the useful data was readable at this point. This was really frustrating, and so I decided to look at something else. And so I'm going to come back to this card later. I also had a go card from a trip to Brisbane for Linux Confe U 2011. Like Manly Fast Ferry card, they use a MyFair Classic 1K, but all of the sectors are locked. Nothing is readable except for the MyFair serial number. And you can freely read that from MyFair Classic cards. So I compared it with the number printed on the card itself. And I followed the same processes with Opal. I observed that all the cards started with 016 and guessed that the last digit was probably a checksum again. And that Go card number is just the MyFair serial number, just in Little Endian. The other thing that we can calculate from this is the check digit. Um, I figured out this a little later on after looking at other agencies' cards. I did a web search for common check digit algorithms, and the first hit I found was something called a LUN checksum, which is used in many different applications and was originally conceived in 1954. And it turns out it was exactly this. And I checked some other cards, and it just all lined up perfectly. But I still have a problem. The card is locked with per card and per sector keys, and absolutely nothing is readable without it. The readers contain a key diversification function that implements something like what's on the slide. They take in a card ID, a sector number, and a key ID. They do something with it, then return a 48-bit key. There's a couple of standard ways to do key diversification, but I don't know if they're any good. And even then, I don't know what the constants are. So this was annoying. I live about 850 kilometers from the nearest go-card agent or value add machine. <laughs> I would really like to read my go-card without having to register the card and ha hand over a bunch of personal information to TransLink. So let's find out more about MyFair Classic cards and what we can do about them. MyFair Classic rolls its own cryptography uh, with an algorithm called Crypto1, and this was first released in 1994. Nothing can possibly go wrong with that at all. What else was introduced in 1994? Netscape Navigator. Internet Explorer wasn't released until 1995. We also have the first Nokia mobile phone with a Nokia tune, the 2110. There are flaws in the crypto systems of both of these products, even though they were considered state-of-the-art and secure at the time. You can't even use Netscape with a site that uses modern cryptography. So I start the story uh, with the first online unlicensed MyFair Classic compatible clone card, which appeared in 2004, some 10 years after the chip's first introduction. These implement Crypto1 and are functionally similar to NXP's chipset. And I should put my own phone on silence, that would be good. There we are. Uh, these implement Crypto1 and are functionally similar to NXP's chips. These would have been done by reverse engineering the card, but these people have commercial interests, so have kept it to themselves. This uh, Fudan card has been rolled out in a number of transit networks worldwide, including in Brazil and Ukraine. The price for a complete card is around 20 US cents each. By comparison, a bare NXP chipset today with no card or antenna costs about $1.25 US each. There are now many other MyFair Classic compatible chips available on the market. And the first published attacks come in 2007, 13 years after the chip's first introduction. Um, previously, Crypto1 was only implemented in hardware, and this particular research inspected logic gates on the chip with a microscope. The team used automated image analysis techniques to reconstruct the circuits and reverse engineer Crypto1, and they found some weaknesses in the process. 
they found a way to break a key in about a week with 100 US dollars worth of hardware. The second set of attacks is, that I've listed focused on card communication. Key recovery was possible in seconds with two authentication sessions with a legitimate reader. Skipping over a little bit of other research, this attack you can do it offline, that is at home without access to a legitimate reader with all the keys. This, uh, this particular attack allows key recovery when you know at least one of the keys on the card. So if a card uses a well-known or a fixed key for at least one sector, you can get all of the others. This takes about five minutes to run with a 30 US dollar reader today. Uh, next up, I have the dark side attack. This is a new tool uh, that allows recovery of a key when you know none of the keys. And this takes about 45 minutes to execute with cheap hardware or about two minutes with good hardware. In March of 2008, uh, NXP were confidentially informed about the issues by a Dutch research team. NXP then attempted to get an injunction against them in order to allow reasonable time for appropriate system security updates. This request, request for injunction was denied by the courts. NXP have come up with a number of countermeasures. Older versions of these documents were once freely published on NXP's websites, but are now only available under a non-disclosure agreement. NXP also released MyFair Plus cards, which are classic compatible, but not vulnerable to the nested or dark side attacks. The document by uh, making the best of MyFair Classic, which is available without an NDA, uh, talks about the different options that you have when enforcing card security, but severely limit the functionality of the cards and require major redesigns of existing systems. They recommend the better option is to switch to another card that has better security. And this is bigger than just transit networks. These cards are used for payments in arcades and in theme parks. They're used in hotels. They're used in access control systems. In order to fix the cards that have the issue, you would need to replace every MyFair Classic card in active circulation. However, this would not prevent against attacks against the readers unless you also break MyFair Classic compatibility in the process. And in the United Kingdom, they're doing exactly that. As of 2010, ITSO and Oyster MyFair Classic cards are no longer sold. And from the start of 2017, ITSO MyFair Classic cards are no longer valid for travel. You can't use Oyster MyFair Classic cards with their new app released in July of 2016. And it turns out that the fixed cards are vulnerable to other attacks as well. They're just much slower. As a result, you can recover keys from a MyFair Plus card in classic compatibility mode if you know at least one of the keys. And you can get that key from a legitimate reader. And there's no solution to this other than disabling MyFair Classic compatibility. And in practice, this means replacing all of your cards all over again. So NXP released another statement when this attack was published. They recommended that everyone move away from MyFair Classic based cards and onto their newer, more secure products. They do not recommend anyone use any implementation of Crypto One, be it their cards, 30 third party implementations, licensed or not, for security relevant applications. So what does this mean in practice? If you have older MyFair Classic cards or clone cards, your attack process is fairly straightforward. You use the dark side attack to get the first key and then the nested attack to get all the others. And this takes about 10 minutes to execute with good hardware. If you have newer MyFair Plus cards in classic compatibility mode, you need to simulate your card's UID with a legitimate reader or sniff some prior communication with a legitimate reader if no key is known. That takes a few seconds to grab the key, but you might have to travel outside of your house for that. After this, you can execute the hard nested attack to get the remaining keys from the card alone. And this takes about an hour and a half to do with good hardware. So let's take this knowledge back to the Go card. When I started looking into all of this, it looked promising that I could break at least the older cards in active circulation. The hard nested attacks weren't really viable until 2016 when public implementations of the attack were published. The Go card was big enough for me to care, so I bought an appropriate reader from Adafruit for about $40. Uh, I've since then built a similar reader with the same chipset for about $25 US dollars from Chinese suppliers. 
I then bought a Proxmark 3, which is an RFID tool based on a software-defined radio, allowing extremely low-level control, which costs about 250 US dollars. This was significantly easier to use and could attack uh, cards more quickly. Um, with the Adafruit reader, um, I spent about half a day getting the software to actually build. The software was unmaintained, and I needed to build specific commits of LibNFC based on notes someone left about their previous subversion repository that was hosted on Google Code, which is now shut down, which has since been converted to Git. And after that, I cracked my first card in about an hour. I loaded the keys onto my phone, I booked some plane tickets to Brisbane, I told my friend I was coming to visit, and then started collecting data. At this point, I had access to the raw data on the card. I then went and did some trips and logged every step of the way. Um, I kept a travel log for all the steps in between. I frequently visited value add machines to check what data was there when I tapped. To find the card balance field, I first made up a backup of the card contents. I recorded the current balance of $3.14 and I added $20 using a value add machine and made another backup of the card. I then used a tool called vbindiff, which shows bin uh, diffs of binary files. And this is really nice to use because as you can see, it just highlights all the changes. Um, and this can be used to map transactions to data. The first thing in this record you can see is, a, is the current balance expressed in cents. Then there's a priority on the record, which, uh, and whichever is highest is uh, the most recent. And this reduces the number of writes to the card in order to make it last longer. And then there's some sort of checksum that is used to validate integrity. Finding the trips was a similar process. I got a before and after of the card data and screenshots of what the value add machine said before and after. I collected many trips to the same station in order to find out what changes when. I also collected some trips with different stations. Um, this was pretty easy because I just got off a stop early or later than normal. The first thing you can see in this record is the mode of transport, and I took a train here. The trip that went away was three days prior to my current trip, um, and it went from 31 to 34, so there's a pretty good chance that, that was the date, and it turned out that it was encoded as day, month, year. And further calculations found the time of day expressed in minutes adjacent. Uh, each trip had a touch on and a touch off event, and these were in pairs, and this slightly overlapped with the timestamp field. The fares were interesting. Um, this particular record shows a debit of $10, which is the fixed or default fare that TransLink would apply to my card if I failed to touch off correctly. Um, when, I, when I touched off correctly, this, would, this fare would be followed by a credit for whatever is the difference between the fixed and the actual fare. Um, this changed if I took a bus first because they have a different fixed fare. Um, this is Little Endian and the highest bit set, if the highest bit is set, then it is debit, otherwise it is a credit. Um, a Fortitude Valley touch event of 04 was knocked off to make way for a Roma Street touch event of 14, and this matched the other events on the cards at these stations. And there's some sort of checksum. Now, the card has no formal structure, and I need a way to identify Go cards from every other MyFair Classic card in circulation. At the start of each card, there was some magical data constant, and every Go card I looked at had this. After this is what I think is a system identifier. I had another very old Go card that used a different system identifier to the current ones. In summary, what I found was a preamble record that allowed me to identify the Go card, the balance records that get alternated, a configuration record that contains the ticket type and the expiry date, um, the top-up records that get alternate and contain times, uh, 12 touch-on and touch-off events which get rotated through automatically and contain times and station IDs. Now, I don't fully understand all of these records, but I know enough for this to be useful. And now the app can read them too once you install the appropriate encryption keys. Thank you. So GoCard is a pretty bad system to deal with, and all data access requires cracking encryption keys. And there are also MyFair Plus cards in circulation, but these are very easy to identify. They have a $10 deposit on cards. Uh, registration is technically optional, but it's required for all online services, and they have no mobile-friendly website. 
and they really should learn some lessons from the Opal card. So as I mentioned at the start of my talk, there are a small number of vendors uh, making ticketing systems and they have many deployments. These are often documented through government tender processes and reports that have been made under freedom of information or other uh, disclosure mandates. So sometime later, I was contacted by someone in Los Angeles who observed that my GoCard code could be used to read Los Angeles tap cards. They sent me spreadsheets and dumps about what they observed on the tap card. And it turned out that they used a system called Cubic Next Fair, and these were both deployed about the same time. It caused me to significantly revise my assumptions about the Go card and showed me other features of the card that Brisbane doesn't use, like monthly travel passes. I refactored my code and now it works for the tap card as well. And there's a total of eight bytes of difference that is the magic between a tap card and a Go card. So now the Go card's all done and dusted and I have some fancy new toys to crack my cards, I can have another go at the Manly Fast Ferry. I applied the previous attacks to the card, and they, use, they have a sector with one well-known key, so I can just use the nested attack. And it turns out they use the same key for every sector on the card, so this was really fast. They also have some newer MyFair Plus cards in circulation, and these can be cracked without access to the readers because they always have a sector with a well-known key, so you can just use the hard nested attack. The process for analyzing this card was a little different. Uh, catching the Faust Ferry is very expensive, costing between $70 and $100 per week. So I used some friends who catch the ferry regularly to validate my assertions. I looked at a bunch of known values on my own card, like cost amounts. I looked for patterns in my travel history receipt, like events that had the same cost, events that had the same time of day, a different day, showing which would have common bytes and some different bytes. Uh, they then use these patterns to sort through the records and figure out, what, figure out what it all must correspond to. There are some interesting differences with the Manly Fast Ferry compared to other transit networks. The card is a, it just uses a simple purse function and everything is either a debit or a credit and each transaction is timestamped. Each card has a different epoch for the date stored relative to the 1st of January 2000. This is stored in a longer field and then there's the dates on the uh, transactions themselves are stored as a number of days since that card epoch in a shorter field. The transactions have no serial number as well, and identical transactions result in identical bytes. To give you an example of this, uh, on the ferry they have a bar, and I was traveling with a friend at the time, so I bought two drinks, and this resulted in identical records being written to my card. So in summary, the there's a preamble record that contains some card magic that allows me to identify the card. There's a metadata record for configuration like the epoch offset. There are three or less balance records, seven or less transaction records, and a bunch of free sectors. And now once you load the encryption keys, you can read it too. Uh, another card system I've looked at is the MyWay and SmartRider cards, and these are slightly different implementations of essentially the same system. These are used in Canberra and Perth, respectively. They also use MyFair uh, Classic cards, which are crackable. You need per card keys in order to read them, but there's also a bunch of fixed keys on the card. So if you have one weak card, you can get those fixed keys and then use it to crack stronger cards. The reader that I've developed in Metrodroid is from dumps and travel history, so it's a little bit rough around the edges. I've never actually used public transportation in Canberra or Perth. The route names on the card are stored in ASCII, so there's no database needed as well. And in Perth, you can pay for parking fees at train stations with a card, but these parking fees are not transactions at all. They only appear to decrement the balance, almost like this was a hack on the side. Uh, there also doesn't appear to be a magic identifier in the card, so Metrodroid detects this by which keys you use to authenticate, and this is stored in the program as salted hashes. And then once you load the encryption keys, you can read it too. So there are some lessons for system operators. Open data formats are better. Uh, there's a Finnish smart card system where the local agency documents their format openly and anyone could figure out your data format, even if you don't want to share. And because Opal has offered some uh, useful information freely, I haven't tried to break the rest of the card. 
NFC smart cards have security weaknesses, and there are other technologies with other problems. They largely depend on security by obscurity, so you should plan on them being compromised. You should plan on them having about as much security as a floppy disk. Now, not everyone in this room has a floppy drive, but it's not hard or expensive to get one. You should also make sure you have fraud detections built into the design and assume that your adversary can change every attribute on the card and roll it back even if the card should make that write once or read only. You also couldn't, shouldn't keep secrets on the card. Uh, do not store any personally identifiable information on the card. I really hope whatever replaces the various MIFA classic based systems in Australia allows some form of data access and web tools that don't require registration. Opal is the best example of this in Australia. But longer term, I think that these systems will move towards credit card NFC payment and ditch the transit card altogether. This makes offline retrieval of transactions no longer possible. So I may have made this look really easy. Figuring out data formats involves a lot of trial and error, and I haven't shown it all here. The general process has been to look for patterns, make some assertions, test them, and repeat and then get lots of angry feedback from your user when stuff breaks. So I have a project, it is called Metrodroid. It is open source software. I also keep a wiki on there with documentation about each card format that I've implemented. It's available on Fdroid and the Google Play Store and additional card reader contributions are welcome. I'm also after some more stop IDs for the Go card and uh, Tap card and other patches are welcome. I'd also like to thank the many people who have supplied me patches, supplied me card dumps and travel history, and pointed out where my assumptions were very wrong. So to wrap up, I have some anticipated questions in lieu of an actual question time. Uh, the most common question I get is, can I copy my transit card to my mobile phone? Unfortunately, the short answer is no, not unless the agency explicitly adds support for it. Android has a system called host card em emulation, which only supports a protocol called EMV, and low level control of the NFC chipset is just not supported. So it wouldn't work for my fair cards. A transit agency could have their own EMV application ID and then allow payments through their own app though. But more likely, the agencies will support paying with NFC enabled credit cards and thus things like Android Pay and Apple Pay. Trials of this have already begun in Sydney with the Manly Slow Ferry. Um, to be dif differentiated from the Manly Fast Ferry, which is a different company. This has its own drawbacks. Uh, the, all of the transactions must be processed online with a payment gateway involving uh, introducing a trade-off of user latency versus fraud risk. Other question I get is, can't malicious actors now also use this information to get free rides or credit on MyFair Classic transit cards? Now, if you crash your card, you can still back it up when it has some credits, take some trips and restore the backup. And you don't need to know anything about the format in order to do this. And this is just a replay attack. A good system has four detection measures. And so re preventing replay attacks generally also prevents other types of card di data manipulation if done correctly. Most of the, the issues with MyFair Classic cards that I've talked about have been known for about a decade and more secure cards have been around for longer still. So most agencies res resort to traditional methods of tackling fare evasion, such as threatening looking people in high visibility jackets. And none of the information in this presentation, my software or its documentation will help you engage in fare evasion. And I have not tested any of the four permission, uh, prevention measures on any system because I'm just not interested in that. And Metrodroid will never support writing to cards. So Melbourne. <laughs> Melbourne doesn't have much in the way of freely readable data aside from the card number uh, and the balance doesn't appear to be freely readable. Uh, but this doesn't make it more secure than any other system here. They have a website and they could have bugs in that and there could be other weaknesses in the system. Uh, once practical attacks on Deskfire are made, it may be possible to get useful data out of the card alone. Alternatively, uh, PTV could software upgrade the cards with a new freely readable file. Existing apps in this space appear to just read the card number and scrape the Mikey website. I really don't like this because I want to read it offline without registration. I'm of course happy to be proven wrong. 
So Radelaide. Uh, MetroCard has a lot of freely re readable data on the card itself, but when I'm in Adelaide, I tend to drive places. I have some notes, but they're pretty old. Uh, Tasmania, their green card is a MyFair Classic card. I started writing a reader for this, so I just need to finish it. And New Zealand. I really should take some more trips to New Zealand. <laughs> they have a few different card systems, and like Australia, it's a mixed bag of vendors. Interestingly, Wellington Snapper card appears to be homegrown, and they've exported it to Dublin, Ireland, as the Leap card. So, thank you very much for listening today. If you have some more questions, you can come talk to me in the hallway. Thank you very much, Michael. That was great. Thank you very the much. The got a small gift for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's our afternoon tea time. See you all back after the break. <laughs>